I want to talk about the uniqueness of this present age. There is a divine program of the ages, and it consists of different ages within those that age. If you refer to the scriptures as the Old and the New Testament, then you bear witness to the fact that God has divided his program into time segments. When we study the Bible, we identify certain well-defined time periods, which are clearly indicated where that we recognize the revealed purpose of God relative to each time period. You are living in a very unique age. The sovereign purpose of God is seen in the ordering of the succession of the ages. That God has a program of the ages is disclosed in many passage, passages, uh, Deuteronomy, Daniel, Hosea, Matthew, Acts, Romans, uh, even in Revelation. The Apostle Paul writes of the period between Adam and Moses in Romans 5.14, and John speaks of the law as given by Moses, but of grace and truth as coming by Christ, John chapter 1, verse 17. Christ also speaks of the times of the Gentiles, uh, Luke 21.24, which are evidently to be distinguished from Jewish times and seasons, Acts 1.7, 1, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.1. Likewise, he spoke of of an unannounced period between his two comings, which have distinctive features of Matthew chapter 13 and predicted a yet future time of great tribulation. And he defined its character in Matthew 24. There are uh, last days for Israel, Isaiah chapter two, as well as last days for the church, 2 Timothy 3. The apostle John, John, he anticipates a period of, of a thousand years and he relates that to the reign of Christ at which time the church, his bride, will reign with him, Revelation chapter 20, that Christ will sit on the throne of David and reign over the house of Jacob forever is declared by the angel Gabriel, uh, Luke chapter 1, and that there will be an ever abiding new heaven and new earth that is clearly revealed in Isaiah chapter 65, 66, 2 Peter 3, and Revelation 21. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, a sharp contrast is drawn between time past when God spoke to the fathers by the prophets and these last days when he is speaking unto us by his Son. In the same way, it is clearly revealed that there are ages past of Ephesians chapter 3 and Colossians 1. There's the present age spoken of in Romans chapter 12 and Galatians chapter 1 and the age or the ages to come, Ephesians chapter 2, Hebrews 6, Ephesians chapter 1, where that the future age is termed the dispensation of the fullness of times. In relation uh, of Christ to the ages when it comes to his relationship to those ages, an examination of passages in the New Testament that make reference to the program of the ages will show us that Christ is the very center of that program. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, he is said to be the one on whose account the ages were ordered. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Christ is related to the program of the ages, where he is called the king of the ages. In Hebrews chapter 9 and 1 Corinthians 10, the ages are seen to center in his person and work on behalf of his people. This very work was planned before the ages began, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 1, and Titus chapter 1, and in past ages that which is now known was not revealed, Romans chapter 16. Therefore, the ages are the time periods within which God is revealing his divine purpose and program as it centers in the Lord Jesus Christ. This age is referred to in Scripture as an organized system, system under and primarily a religious system under the domination of Satan, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, and 2 Timothy 4. It's an age of the ungodly, the world is apart from God. Uh, evil in its tendency, John chapter 7 and 14 and 27, 
1 Corinthians 1, James 1, 1 John 4. So there are separate ages of God's dealing with men. It, it may refer to a past age. It may refer to the present age or a future coming age. There is reference to a present age for Israel in Matthew chapter 12 and Mark chapter 4, and also to a future age for Israel in Matthew uh, 12, 13, 24, Mark chapter 10, and Luke chapter 18, and chapter, Luke chapter 20. In regard to the program for the church, there is also a reference to this present age in 1 Corinthians 1, Galatians 1, and to a future age in Ephesians 1. The present age for the church, spoken of by Paul, is not the same as the present age for Israel spoken of by Christ, nor is the expectation in the future age for the church the same as that for Israel. In order to see this distinction, we have to clearly understand the context of the passage that we're reading and those to whom it is addressed. Who is he speaking to? And much confusion has resulted from a failure to see this distinction. You are living, folks, in that period from the rejection of the Messiah by Israel to his coming for the church, uh, which is followed by the tribulation period, uh, sort of a mini, mini age, if you will. And according to the New Testament, this present age has an unwholesome designation. It is called an evil age in Galatians 1 because it is under the dominion of Satan, who is its God, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This age is marked by spiritual darkness, Ephesians chapter 6. This darkness produces its own wisdom in which there is no light, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And as a result, it is marked by ungodliness and lusts, Titus chapter 2, from which the believer is to turn away from, Romans chapter 12 even though formerly he walked in conformity to that world's religious system with its wisdom and its standards, Ephesians chapter 2. There are clear distinct distinctions between this present age and the preceding ages. There are a number of ways in which this present age differs from all of the other ages that preceded. In all previous ages, Christ was anticipated, but in this present age, he's not only come, but he's died, he's been resurrected, and he is looked to now in his position at the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit, who in previous ages came upon certain men to empower them to some given task, has taken up his residence in every believer. In previous ages, the good news announced was anticipated, but in this present age, the declaration of the good news, the gospel, announces an accomplished salvation through Christ. The revelation in previous ages was incomplete, but in this present age, since, since Christ came to reveal the Father, revelation is completed. And Paul was chosen by God to complete that, that his word. Since this present age is marked by hatred toward God and his people, it bears a distinct characterization as an evil age which was not applied to any previous age. This age is consequently under the domination of Satan, its God, in a unique and unprecedented way. The nation Israel has been set aside as the particular object of God's dealing, and Israel cannot expect the fulfillment of her promises during this age. And these seven distinctions that I've mentioned establish the fact that this present age is distinct from all pre preceding ages, and you and I are living in it. God has a divine purpose for this present age. He has a purpose for this age in which you are placed into. The Old Testament age in which the purpose of God for Israel is stated in the covenants into which God entered uh, with his people and, and by which he is bound closes with those purposes unrealized. 
After the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, God instituted a new divine program, not to replace the program for Israel, but to interrupt that divinely covenanted program. This new program is anticipated by the Lord in his upper room discourse in John 13 to 16, and it becomes actual after the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. The Jerusalem Council, as we read about in Acts chapter 15, announced that God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. To take out a people for his name. This taking out of a people constitutes God's present age program. This speaks of the church, the body of which he is the head, Ephesians chapter 1, the bride of which he is the bridegroom, Ephesians chapter 5, the branch of which he is the vine, the supporting vine, John chapter 15, the flock of which he is the shepherd, John chapter 10, the temple of which he is the cornerstone, Ephesians 2 and 1 Peter 2, the ministering of the ministering priests of which he's the high priest, First Peter two, the new creation of which he is the head and the first fruits, First Corinthians chapter fifteen. That is the age you and I are living in, and it wasn't by accident that we were placed here. The reason for this calling out is stated in Ephesians 2, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. So the divine purpose in the outcalling of the church is to display the wonders of his marvelous grace. That, that's the purpose. There was that in God which no created being had ever seen. They had seen his glory. They had seen his majesty. They had seen his wisdom. And they had seen his power. But no angel or man had ever seen God's grace. The manifestation of grace is God doing for, for, for his people who in spite of the fact that they deserve his judgments, are objects of his grace. That is the age you and I were born in, placed in by God. To say that a sinner is saved by grace is to declare that on the ground of a substitutionary death, God has wrought a work so perfect and so complete, so perfect in its entirety, totally free from the cooperation of other beings, that it is a complete, all-satisfying-to-God demonstration of His grace. This demonstration will, by the very nature of the case, have its outshining in the life of every individual who is redeemed. It has been said that if God had only chosen one individual for the supreme honor of exhibiting eternally before all created beings His infinite sovereign grace, the salvation of that one would be no different than the salvation of any one of the unnumbered multitude from every kindred, tribe, and tongue who were saved by grace. So it would seem then that God in this present age is pursuing a program through which His infinite grace shall be perfectly displayed throughout all eternity. Dearly beloved, that is the age you and I were born into by God. This present age, dating from the rejection of the Messiah by Israel unto the rapture of the church, leading to the reception of the Messiah by Israel at his second coming, is viewed in Scripture as a mystery. Paul makes this clear when he, when he writes, who, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind, that which is lacking of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation, that is the word means age, of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known 
what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 27. In this passage, the Apostle Paul very clearly calls the divine program developed in the church a mystery, something which was not formerly revealed and therefore unknown, but now is made known by God. With this teaching, other scripture is in agreement. It's supported by many verses, Romans chapter 16, 1 Corinthians 2, Ephesians 3. Now, while the modern usage of the word mystery relates a mystery to that which is mysterious or something that's unknown or mysteriously unknown, scripture uses the word for that divine purpose or program of God known to him from eternity, but which could not and would not have been known unless it was revealed by God. Unknown in other ages, but now known by revelation. Mysteries are sacred secrets before unknown, but now known by revelation. The existence of this present age which was to interrupt God's established program with Israel was a mystery. We, we know that from Matthew chapter 13, that Israel was to be blinded so that Gentiles might be brought into relation to God. That was a mystery, Romans chapter 11. The formulation of the church made up of Jews and Gentiles to form a body was a mystery, Ephesians chapter 3, Colossians 1, Ephesians 1, Romans 16, this whole program of God that results in salvation was called a mystery, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The relation of Christ to men in redemption was called a mystery, Colossians 2 and 4. The incarnation itself is called a mystery, 1 Timothy 3. The development of evil uh, unto its culmination in the man of sin, the Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians 2 in the development of the great apostate religious system, Revelation chapter 17, both constitute that which was called a mystery. That there should be a new method by which God received men into his presence apart from death was a mystery, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So these then constitute a major portion of God's program for the present age, which was not revealed in other ages, but which is now, but is now known by revelation and only by revelation from God. This whole age existed in the mind of God without having been revealed in the Old Testament. And you just happened, I'll put that in quotes, to be born into it. There are many places in Scripture in which this passing over of the present dispensation is very plainly evident. And dearly beloved, if we refuse to notice these so-called gaps, these divisions, these dispensations, we cannot possibly understand the Scriptures that we're reading. The divine purpose and the outcalling of the church is to display the infinity of His grace. There was that in God which no created being had ever seen. Have you seen it? 